In our previous discussions, we've manually provided a color for each vertex of our meshes. Realize, however, that this isn't normally how we do it. So in this tutorial, we're going to talk about lighting, and before we continue, make sure that you understand the lecture on vectors, because in this tutorial there's going to be a lot of them. So what is light? Well, in the real world, it's a really complex process. And to prove my point, find a dark area in the room that you're in, whether it's under a table or in a corner, and notice that it's impossible for that area to be entirely unlit. In other words, that area can't be completely dark. So my question to you is, how is it being lit? Well, as I said before, light has a lot of complex properties. For example, light reflects off of other objects, especially shiny ones like mirrors. It also refracts or changes its direction through other media like water and heat. So to answer that original question, light comes from everywhere, and we call this concept global illumination. So for example, in the image in the upper right hand part of your screen, we have one light that's placed on the ceiling. However, what's really happening is that light source is initially illuminating all of the objects that are in that room, and because of that, those objects then in turn become light sources themselves. And you can see a subtle example of that by looking at the sphere in the lower right part of that room, and notice that the right side of it is being turned green from the green wall that you can't see. Light has other properties that make it even more complex, such as the effect that you get looking across a lake. And this is called the Fresnel effect. You can see an example of that in the lower right image, where you can see objects that are below you better than those that you can see further away. So because there's no way to accurately replicate real-world light, we're forced to make approximations. And therefore, there's a trade-off between time and realism. But all of this is okay because in computer graphics, if it looks good, it is good. So to get a better intuition about lighting, let's see an example. Now in a previous lecture, we had figured out how to calculate the normal of a triangle. In this example, we've included a light source, and light is coming uniformly from one direction. Now we'll call this a directional light, and we'll talk about it later, but realize that the position of this light doesn't matter. Now because the light is coming from above, and the normal of this triangle is facing that direction, the triangle is going to be almost fully lit. As we change the direction of this light source so that it comes more from the side, the triangle is going to be less lit. If we were to change the direction so that it comes directly from the side, little to no light is going to hit the surface of this triangle. So let's see if we can dissect what's going on. Here, we still have a directional light, but I'm going to represent that using one vector. And for visualization purposes, I'm going to extend this vector out so that it touches the tail of the normal vector. So the main idea that you should take away from this part of the lecture is that lighting depends on the angles between vectors. And it's not just these vectors N and L, but it's going to be others that are introduced later on. All right, in computer graphics, we can break lighting down into four independent components. The first one is the diffuse component, and this is the way that the light falls off of an object. And you can see an example of that in the first image. Now looking at that image, you can see that the surface looks porous, or it looks a little bit rough. In other words, it doesn't look like a hard object. Now moving on to the specular component, this is the shininess of the object. And that shininess is going to tell us how hard the surface of that object might be. So in the second image, you can see that we've combined the diffuse component with the specular component. The third component is called the ambient component, and it's very subtle. We use this as a hack to simulate global illumination. So in this third image, we've combined the diffuse, specular, and ambient lighting components. Now it may be a little bit difficult to notice, but you can see the ambient component if you compare images 2 and 3. It's most pronounced in the lower right hand part of that image. The fourth component is called emit, and it's really not used very often, but it provides a glowing effect. Now I've over-exaggerated that in the fourth image, just so you can see what it looks like. Now there's an important note here, realize that emit does not actually produce light. In other words, this sphere is not going to illuminate other objects that are in the scene. Now the final color that we generate is going to be the interaction of several different things. The mesh that we're trying to render has a base color called a material. And a material has separate colors for its diffuse, specular, ambient, and emit components. The final color is also determined by the light color, which also has diffuse, specular, ambient, and emit properties. And as an example, imagine that we have a light source that's casting purple light on a white surface. You can imagine that the final color of that object is going to be purple. There are also things like textures that are going to dictate the final color, but we'll talk about those later. All right, so as we discussed, materials and lights each have four individual components. They have their diffuse color, their specular color, the ambient color, and the emit color. And notice how we denote these components. 
So for example, we have LD, LS, LA, and LE for the four lighting components for a light. Now if we were to multiply the mesh's diffuse color, which is denoted as CD, by the light's diffuse color, which is denoted as LD, we're going to do this component-wise similar to how we added vectors together. Notice the result of this operation is going to return us three components which represent the red, green, and blue of the interaction between the object's diffuse color and the light's diffuse color. Now we're going to have four primary vectors that we're going to be working with. There's L, which represents the incoming light direction. There's N, which represents the normal of a vertex or even a pixel. You also have R, which is the reflection vector. And notice that the reflection vector is actually just the mirror image of L. And finally, we have vector V, which represents the viewpoint of the user. In other words, it's the camera. All right, good. So to calculate the diffuse component, we're only going to need vectors N and L. Now, the reason that we don't need these other vectors is because the light that's falling on an object is the same regardless of where the camera is. Also, you should note that this lighting model is really good for rough surfaces. In other words, those without any specular highlights. So if we're going to calculate the base amount of light that's hitting this surface, it's going to be relative to the angle between vector n and vector l. In other words, it's going to be n dot l times cd times ld. And again, for this to happen, n and l are both normalized. Now it's important to understand the results of this operation. You can see that n dot l is going to give us a value between negative 1 and positive 1. In other words, it's a scalar. And when I multiply cd times ld, that's going to give me back something with three parts. So when I multiply the scalar times something with three parts, I should expect to get back something with three parts. Now there is one detail that I've neglected to include, and that's the fact that n dot l can return us a negative value. Now negative values don't really make sense in lighting. You can't have negative light. So what we do is we take the max of n dot l with zero. And what that's going to do is guarantee that the light intensity is never going to be negative. All right, now moving on to the specular component, this one is dependent on the camera's viewpoint. So in this case, what we're going to do is create something called a half vector, which we'll denote as h. And that's the vector that's halfway between vector v and vector l. Now the question is, how do you calculate it? Well, in this blend fung reflection model, you can calculate h by adding vectors v and l together. Now I've tried to visualize that in the image that you see here. You can see that I've copied v and moved it to the tail of l. And by visually adding v and l together, you can see that we get h. And one last note, yes, these vectors need to be normalized. So now that we've calculated the half vector h, the specular component can be written as n dot h raised to some constant s times c sub s times l sub s. Now you may be asking yourself, what's this magic number s? We'll realize that n dot h is always going to return us something less than 1. So raising it to a power is actually going to make it smaller. It's because of this that s is really the shininess factor. So what I've done is rendered out a couple of spheres, and I really can't remember the values of s. These are just approximations. But in the left image, you can see that s is approximately 1, and therefore the specular highlight is huge. In the middle image, s is approximately 30 from what I remember, and you can see that the specular highlight is considerably smaller. In the right-hand image, you can see that s is approximately 255, and the specular highlight has shrunk even more. So by changing that constant s, you can see that it has a huge impact on our perception of the hardness of this object. All right, we still have two components to talk about. We have ambient and emit. And remember that ambient lighting is used to simulate global illumination, because real-world lighting is far too complex for real time. And we also have emit, which is used to make the object glow. But again, remember that emit does not actually emit light. Now, both of these components are independent of the camera's viewpoint. And they're also super easy to calculate, because we can just add the ambient and emit components like you see here. So if we take into consideration everything that we've seen up to this point, we can determine the final color by summing up all of the components. In other words, we'll add the final diffuse, the final specular, the final ambient, and the final emit to generate the final color. There's a great visualization of what that process looks like in this image that I pulled from Wikipedia. All right, so what do you do if you have multiple lights in a scene? Well, the process is that we calculate a series of colors using the material of the object with each light in the scene. So in this example, we'll store that information into an array called f. Then, once we've done those calculations, we sum them up together to generate the final color. Now, if this equation doesn't make any sense, that's OK. But realize that that giant sigma there represents a loop in many programming languages. All right, to finish out, we're going to take a look at some of the common kinds of lights that you may see. Specifically, we're going to look at the concepts of a point light, a directional light, a spotlight, and an area light. 
Now there's a couple of interesting facts about lights. First of all, light sources cannot be seen, only their effects. In other words, if you place a light source in the scene, you're not going to see some kind of lens flare appear on the screen. Also, you should understand that we can light per vertex, which is really fast, or we can light per fragment, which is slower, but with the increased power in GPUs, this is becoming the common way that we do our lighting. All right, the first light that we'll look at is called a point light, and these lights have a position in 3D space. Because of its behavior, sometimes people call point lights a lamp, and with a point light, light is going to emanate from that 3D position and go out in all directions. Now, because this is a point light and it behaves like a lamp, the distance is going to determine the intensity of that lighting. Now, most commonly, intensity is calculated as 1 over the distance squared. So you can see in the example on the right that the middle of the square is brighter than the other regions because it's closer to the light source. You should also note that in this example, we've used per fragment lighting. And what that means is that each red pixel that you see here was calculated using a lighting equation. Instead, what we could have done is to use per vertex lighting. And in this case, what would happen is that we would light each vertex and then calculate the in-between colors using interpolation. So you can see that compared to per fragment lighting, we're losing a lot of that lighting information. All right, the second kind of light that we're going to talk about is a directional light. And this is the same kind of light that we saw at the beginning of this tutorial. These lights are sometimes called suns, and they're considered to be infinitely far away. Now, the interesting thing about these kinds of lights is that the position in no way matters. It only has a direction. So strangely enough, you could take one of these directional lights and put it below a plane, and it would still light that plane. In the image that you see here on the right, I tried to visualize a directional light, and I actually used per fragment lighting. Now, if you're asking yourself why all the pixels are the same color, it's because all of these pixels have the same normal, and the light is coming from exactly one direction. The third kind of light that we'll talk about is a spotlight, and this is a special form of a point light because it's conical in shape. Now, when you create a spotlight, it's going to have both an inner and an outer cone angle. Now, clearly, anything that's on the inside of the inner cone is going to be lit, and anything outside of the outer cone is going to be unlit. And that area that's unlit is called the umbra. Now, the areas that are between the inner and the outer cone are in partial shadow, and we call this the penumbra. Finally, you should note that I had to add an ambient light to this scene, because otherwise you wouldn't have been able to see the edges of the plane. The fourth kind of light that we'll talk about is not really common in OpenGL, but it's called an area light. You can think of it as being similar to a point light, but instead of it being a point that's emitting the light, it's going to be a surface. Area lights have both a position and a direction, and I tried to visualize that here. But the idea behind area lights is that they provide a smoother drop-off than a normal point light, and therefore they're going to provide smoother shadows. So that's it. Hopefully you understand a little bit more about lighting concepts and the mathematics behind them.